focus on headline. All right, let's find out what's happening in the uh, uh, headlines today. We've got some major issues that we want to cover here on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters, Yoon se young and Lee ji young Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Yeah, good, good evening. Good evening, everybody. It's, it's a little bit awkward, yeah. like, like seeing each other's face without a mask. <laughs> exactly. It's been three years since the last I know, time I saw I you without the mask. Yeah, yeah. So I had to get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> we're all getting used to. <laughs> we're all getting used to uh, getting to know each other again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, for some people, it's the first time I'm seeing. I mean, I've seen you guys both without yeah, masks before, yeah. but uh, some of our other guests, it was like the first time ever that we had no mask. But uh, it is something that we need to get used to here. Mm -hmm. Guys, uh, something that we have been trying to get used to is the uh, the rising interest rates, uh, the not so slowing down inflation, although mm -hmm. uh, we have been seeing inflation kind of uh, settle down a bit here. Uh, one of the things that we watch very carefully is what the U.S. Fed uh, does with their policy, their policymakers, whether or not they're going to be raising rates. Well, the consensus was that they were going to raise it by another 25 basis points. That's exactly what they did. Uh, of course, on Wednesday, this is their eighth hike since March of last year. Uh, quite contrast to the hawkish hikes that have been taking so far here. Jiang, uh, tell us more about the latest uh, U.S. Fed hike. Oh, sure. Now, the U.S. Central Bank announced during the Federal Open Market Committee that it would be raising federal interest rates by 0.25%, bringing them to a range of 4.50% to 4.750% after recent signs that the inflationary pressures have started to cool. Now, the rate increase was widely anticipated by markets, with analysts pricing the odds of a 25 basis point hike at 98% and the odds of a 50 point basis point hike at 2%. So the majority of people kind of thought this was coming, yeah, knew yeah. that this was coming. So the Re Federal Reserve Chair uh, Jerome Powell said at a news conference that the Fed recognizes that the pace of inflation has cooled down, uh, which is a significant, which is is a signal that it could be nearing uh, the end of its rate increases. Now, frequently acknowledged signs that the high inflation is slowing. Uh, Powell has even gone on to say that the disinflationary process has even started. Yet, he also stressed that it was too soon to declare victory over the worst inflation um, that has been in four decades, saying that there has, be, has to be some substantially more evidence to be confident that inflation is on a long, sustained downward path. Uh, that's why Powell said that he doesn't expect the Fed to cut rates this year. Uh, meanwhile, as the Fed lowered the pace of interest rate hikes to the normal level as expected, it has also eased the kind of eased the burden of interest hikes for the Bank of Korea itself. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, uh, the U.S. Fed was saying that there's going to be no rate hike uh, rate cuts until maybe next year, signaling that uh, they're going to well, even though they're going to slow down to raise uh, the interest rate hikes, they're still going to continue to raise it. Uh, but the fact is, I mean, for the longest time, South Korea, the Bank of Korea had uh, higher interest rates than. Uh, the U.S. Fed, but there has been a reversal for quite a bit. And when there is a bigger gap, we've saw as seen before, uh, for example, the Korean one tanking against the U.S. dollar. I mean, mm -hmm. now, uh, if you compare it to, uh, you know, the middle of last year, I mean, the Korean one rebounded really well here. Uh, but nevertheless, the thing is, yes, uh, they might be saying that the, the worst of the inflation is over. But the fact of the matter is uh, the inflation prices that we've seen now, for example, I keep mentioning this, the 4 4 uh, 10,001 beers uh, that are now 11,000 uh, mm -hmm. Korean won for four four cans that I buy at these uh, convenience stores. They're not going to go back down in prices. It's going to be right. kept that way. Mm -hmm. It's just that the vast majority of the inflation figures are from the gas prices, the electricity prices, and those don't seem to be going down that much. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, consumer prices key inflation barometer rose 5.2 percent in january this is because of the soaring electricity and gas bills uh, saying you have more on this Yes, according to the data released by the Statistic Korea on Thursday, the Consumer Price Index in January stood at 110.11, a 5.2% from a year ago. It's 0.2 uh, <coughs> percentage points higher than the previous month, and it is also first time in three months since October last year that the growth pace accelerated from the previous month. 
Consumer prices has remained in 5% range for nine consecutive months since recording 5.4% in May last year. And 5% range is a concerning figure because last time it exceeded the 5% range was during 2008 global financial crisis. And taking a look at the causes of the growth, um, although rising oil prices has slowed, as SJ mentioned, energy price rise like electricity and gas bills along with water bill attributed to the growth and plus food prices also have risen since the beginning of the year. To give you a more specific number, electricity, gas and water bills rose at 28.3 percent a year in January, the highest since 2010 when the nation started compiling related data. Along with that, property management fees called Kongdong Chutek Walibi in Korean went up 5.8 percent, putting more burden on the livelihoods of many people living in South Korea. Commodity prices rose 6.7 percent from a year ago, of which industrial products rose 6 percent, and processed foods rose 10.3 percent, as in the previous month. And you will notice that when you purchase snacks, kwaja or ramyeon at a grocery store. And service prices also went up 3.8 percent. In particular, personal services rose 5.9 percent, as the cost of eating out has risen by 7.7 percent. So both grocery store prices and restaurant prices have jumped, letting many young people choose to eat at convenience stores. On top of that, both core inflation and prices of daily necessities um, closely related to people's ev- everyday lives climbed 4.1% and 6.1% respectively. You know, the saddest thing that I saw a couple of days ago at a uh, convenience store uh, across the street from where I live, mm. uh, I was stopping by there to pick up something. There was a uh, elementary school kid. And uh, he's standing there, and you know, at the ele- uh, the convenience stores, they also sell like snacks, uh, right. like chicken, fried chicken, and mm-hmm. stuff like mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. like uh, skewered chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, here's this elementary school kid. He has a thousand five hundred one, and mm-hmm. this is what he always carries around to buy a stick of chicken and stuff like that. And it's a thousand eight hundred. And so mm-hmm. he's asking, why is it a thousand eight hundred now? <laughs> I bought it for a thousand five hundred every day for the past like few years now, and uh, the the owner basically said, "Well, I mean, it went up three hundred one," and he's like, "I only have a thousand five hundred and then you know I ended up giving him three hundred one, which is oh, like, "Oh, that's, that's nice, nice of you." He reminded me of me when I was in that age, oh, oh, wow. chubby little kid, <laughs> buying <laughs> chicken skewers <laughs> after school. <laughs> wanted, wanted that chicken skewer, but Sorry, I mean, uh, kids yeah. kids are <laughs> impacted by the. Oh, Kids no. are feeling the uh, the brunt of the inflation as mm-hmm. well, and it goes back. That's I mean, right. It's not going to go down. Reality. Yeah, and if the inflation figure, if the consumer prices go down, it's, it's not like that. The price is going to go back down to a thousand five hundred one, mm-hmm. and the kid's going to be happy again. It's, that's the thing. Now we're set on this price that we're probably yeah. going to see uh, moving forward here. Uh, but again, we have seen the interest rates slowly cool down the pace of inflation in the United States, but. Sort of a different story here in South Korea, especially with the soaring utility bills, other public charges, this including public transportation costs, uh, which is going to increase, definitely not helping with the government's efforts to you know, tame inflation. Ji uh, let's talk about what the government is doing to tackle this problem. Sure. Now, under normal st- circumstances, if inflation rises and the interest rate gap uh, with the U.S. widened, uh, Korea usually goes to raise the base uh, base rate higher. Yeah. So that's usually like the formula. Mm-hmm. But the problem has become even more difficult due to the recent negative growth that the country has been experiencing at the moment. So Korea's real GDP growth growth compared to the previous year, uh, a previous quarter has already turned negative in the fourth quarter of last year due to sluggish exports. And there are even forecasts that um, negative growth will continue until the first quarter of this year. So the bank in of Korea and the Korean government are generally focusing on a scenario in which the government hits the bottom in the first half of the year and then rebounds in the second half. So that is their ideal scenario. Mm -hmm. Uh, The forecast reflects on expectations that China and the IT economy will probably improve after the second half. But right now, the Bank of Korea has to decide the base rate hike by taking into consideration of all conflicting economic conditions, such as the conflicting inflation versus the sluggish economy at the monetary policy meeting on the 23rd of February. Um, in last month's meeting, the monetary policy committee members, uh, the, their views on whether to focus on the direction of monetary policy or additional bake 
uh, base rate hikes, they've been split to almost three to three. So mm-hmm. it's a half-half situation here. So half of the committee wants the rate hikes to continue, and the other uh, half wants the, to slow down the rate hikes to take off some of the burdens and kind of create a more consumer-driven economy. Now, normally, the Bank of Korea governor, um, as the chairman of the Monetary Policy Committee, doesn't express his or her personal opinion and asks kind of as a casting vote when our opinions are divided in half. So this is kind of that situation where the Bank of Korea governor would have to uh, be the casting vote on the 23rd. And uh, experts say that it's likely that he will pick a side and make the decision to raise or freeze the interest rate. So we'll just have to see after the 23rd. Yeah, and that's been kind of uh, the tricky thing for South Korea is uh, it's different with the United States uh, where I don't think people went off buying houses left and right because of the near zero interest rates and things like that. I mean, that's the main reason as to why uh, the Bank of Korea is having a hard time thinking about whether or not they want to raise mm-hmm. it. And that's all the, luckily the uh, the consumer prices hasn't been, the inflation hasn't been as bad as for example, like in Europe, where it was like, like 10%, I believe. And then the US was something like 7%. Here in South Korea is 5%. So luckily the inflation level hasn't been as, as high. So they didn't have to raise the uh, interest rates as much. But the other side is they they want to raise it, but think about all the, the the record household debt that South Korea already has, mm-hmm. and how much of a burden it will be for all the people that bought all those houses, especially young among young people. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, a lot of them, you know, we call it younger, right? Basically, mm-hmm. taking out all the loans that they could potentially take. And uh, there's already a lot of people who are saying that they are unable to, you know, pay the mortgages and the interest rates and things like that. And the government, on the flip side, knows that if it goes any higher and people are forced to buy these, uh, sell these houses. It's going to be a huge collapse on the real estate market there, and they're trying to also uh, avoid that as much as possible. Uh, let's also talk about uh, Finance Minister Chu Kyung Ho, uh, who said that uncertainties in the international financial market has decreased as the U.S. Federal Reserve slowed down the pace of their hikes, uh, raised the interest rates by only a quarter percentage points, as we mentioned earlier. Seung, uh, tell us more about this. Sure. Finance Minister Chu kyung ho held an emergency macroeconomic finance meeting with Bank of Korea Governor Lee chang yong and the chief of the country's financial mm-hmm. authorities on Thursday. There, he mentioned uh, the Fed's Federal Open Market Committee results and said the Fed, which raises interest rates at an unprecedented pay- pace last year, is believed to have adjusted its pace now and it will stabilize the global market overall. Actually, the global financial market remained stable overnight as uncertainties are now somewhat resolved, at least regarding what stance Jerome Powell will take in the future. That's because until the end of last year, he was very cautious about slowing down the pace of the rate hikes, warning of some pain or saying um, that we have some ways to go. Regarding the domestic financial market, he said volatility seems to be easing this year due to the government's efforts to stabilize the market and expectations towards major countries to adjust the pace of monetary tightening. Meanwhile, the finance minister also stressed that economic uncertainty is, however, still high, uh, referring to the sluggish export and high inflation. We've been talking about the export figures, the concerning export figures uh, all throughout this week. Right. Um, Finance Minister Chu stressed uncertainty is still high amid soaring prices that are expected to remain high for the time being and the nation's sluggish exports. As discussed several times before, Korea's export situation is not so good right now. It reached a record high monthly trade deficit of 12.69 billion US dollars in January. And especially when it comes to semiconductors, which account for 20% or one fifth of Korea's exports, the global demands for semiconductors continue to fall. And of course, uh, as we mentioned earlier, consumer prices, the gauge of inflation are expected to remain high, which will also affect consumer sentiment. To fight against this gloomy situation, Chu pledged that the government and related agencies will strengthen market monitoring system and respond uh, respond in a timely manner according to the nation's contingency plans. He also stressed that he would strengthen the stability of the domestic financial market and manage risk in the real estate sector. He especially mentioned the PF project financing and and promised to stabilize the PF market. 
That is because you know soaring number of unsold newly built houses leading to growing project financing loans in real estate is another very concerning issue here in South Korea these days. On top of that, she said the government will actively induce a soft lending in the real estate market by expanding liquidity support for construction companies and normalizing uh, real estate loan regulations. Well, there's a reason why these uh, newly built apartments aren't being sold is because back in the days, remember we used to call it like lottery, right? Mm-hmm. It's like hitting the lottery because a lot of these uh, <clears throat> new apartments, which or again, everyone wants to live in a new apartment. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would usually cost like about, I don't know, like in Seoul, like a million dollars or something like that, you were able to buy it for like $400,000, $500,000. Uh, mm-hmm. And because you could buy for so cheap that people were, it was called the lottery, right? Mm-hmm. But people were flipping this. And uh, nowadays, uh, even if you try to get these uh, newly uh, built uh, apartment complexes, they're like twelve, like a million, million and a half dollars uh, to buy these new apartment complexes, and no one's got money for that. And that's right. why there's a lot of places that are just um, being sold. No one has cash like that. That's the mm-hmm. thing. And uh, of course, even with the, and also with the high interest rates, no one could borrow that much money and pay it off as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, nevertheless, uh, well, we'll see if they'll be able to uh, stabilize the market there. Uh, let's talk about diplomacy uh, but also on the on the military level here uh, South Korea and US defense ministers meeting and agreeing to expand and bolster the level and scale of joint military exercises earlier this week and the two countries militaries uh, took absolutely no time and held uh, joint air drills on Wednesday now here's the thing it featured strategic bombers and stealth fighters. Now, obviously, North Korea is not going to be a big fan of this. Chiang, can you tell us more about this? Uh, sure. Now, the exercises, as you mentioned, came a day after South Korean Defense Minister Lee jong sup and his counterpart, Lloyd Austin, vowed to boost security cooperation to counter a nuclear-armed North Korea. Now, the South Korean Defense Ministry said through a press conference, a uh, press release, that the drills on Wednesday showed the U.S. will and U.S.'s wills and capabilities to provide strong and credible extended deterrence against North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. Now, they involved American B-1B long-range heavy bombers and F-35A fighter jets from South Korea's Air Force flying over the Yellow Sea. Now, the ministry said that the drills were in line with agreements reached during the two country summit and defense ministerial level security consult- consultative meeting last year to deploy U.S. strategic assets in a timely and coordinated manner. Now, it added that the drills also reflected the Allies' firm determination to guard South Korea's national security and the safety of its people from North Korea's provocations. Yeah, and again, uh, you know, who's not going to be a big fan of this? Well, North Korea, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. of the strengthened military cooperation, because of this uh, joint military drill between South Korea and the United States. North Korea came out warning of what they said was going to be the toughest reaction to any sort of uh, military plans uh, from the United States. So hey, let's get the details on that. We will respond to nuclear weapons with nuclear weapons and to face-to-face confrontation with face-to-face confrontation. That's what North Korea's 40 ministry spokesman said in a statement released on Thursday, lashing out at the development of U.S. strategic assets announced by U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Just like last year, Pyongyang did not signal the possibility of resuming the dialogue, but instead it suggested the possibility of provocative military actions under the pretext of Washington's extended deterrence commitment against North Korea's nuclear threats and Seoul-Washington joint military drills. In addition, the spokesman accused the U.S. of continuing to attack and pressure North Korea in various areas, including human rights, sanctions, and military. The North criticized the South South Korea U.S. Uh, expansionary deterrence exercise called DSCTTX scheduled for this month and the Korea-U.S. joint field maneuvers which have expanded in size and scope as an act of encouraging a full-scale confrontation. In response, Washington on Wednesday local time rejected the idea that South Korea-U.S. joint exercises are a uh, provocation against North Korea. A White House spokesman stressed, we have made it clear that we have no hostile 
hostile intentions against North Korea and that we are pursuing serious and continuous diplomacy to deal with a wide range of concerns in both countries and the surrounding regions. Well, we don't know how North Korea will comment on Washington's statement, but so far, as I mentioned earlier, Pyongyang completely blocked the possibility of dialogue. And a spokesman said the U.S. continues to insist that it has no hostile intentions while pursuing an enormous hosti- hostile policies toward North Korea, saying the door to dialogue will not be open unless U.S. changes its hawkish stance towards North Korea. And as North Korea reiterated as um, face-to-face confrontation and a statement, provocations in response to South Korea, U.S. joint drills are expected to escalate. And now South Korean government is closely monitoring the situation ahead of North Korea's military parade, marking the 75th anniversary of the founding of the People's Army on February 8th. In the meantime, uh, Foreign Minister Park Jin holding talks with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres on Wednesday. Now this to discuss issues on the Korean Peninsula, of course. Uh, this including uh, concerns that North Korea might actually conduct a nuclear test in the near future. I mean, this is something that we've talked about since uh, early last year. Uh, fortunately, that has not happened just yet, but there's more signs that uh, North Korea is indeed now fully uh, prepared to conduct their seventh nuclear test. Hopefully it doesn't happen. But nevertheless, ji uh, can you give us some more details on what was discussed in the meeting between the two? Uh, sure. Now, Secretary General Guterres uh, expressed some serious concern about North Korea's provocation, uh, especially North Korea's nuclear tests, saying that the nuclear test by North Korea would be a devastating blow to the region and also hinder global peace. Now, at the meeting, Minister Park said, quote, as a responsible member of the international community, Korea will fulfill its responsibility together with the United Nations for the protection and expansion of civil liberties, peace and prosperity around the world, unquote. Now, in the South Korean minister's words, the UN chief expressed his full support for Seoul's efforts to achieve sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula. Now, the minister also met separately with ambassadors from members of the UN Security Council and um, requested their support in responding to the North's saber rap- rattling. Now, he also asked for their support in Seoul's bid for a seat as a non-permanent member of the Council for the 2024-2025 term. Let's talk about another very interesting uh, topic here. Um, as you know, not too long ago, uh, South Korea was reviewed by the uh, the UPR, right, the, the Human Rights uh, Review uh, process where they said that uh, you know there's a lot of improvement that they saw when it comes to human rights issues in South Korea, uh, but a number of the member states wanted the abolition of uh, the death penalty here in South mm-hmm. Korea, which, by the way, that was hasn't been implemented in a really, really long time, mm-hmm. despite the fact that we do have technically the death penalty. Uh, Japan was now uh, inspected by the UN for its human rights situation. Uh, it was pointed out by the members of the countries, the member countries, to step up its efforts to resolve the issue of Japan's military sexual slavery, uh, forced labor. During World War II, uh, the discharge of contaminated water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. These are all, of course, uh, three topics that we have been uh, following up on very carefully. Now, the UN member states are pointing this out as well. Seo, tell us more about this. According to the UN Human Rights Council on Thursday, the member states gathered at the UN Office of Geneva conducted a regular human rights review, or UPR, for Japan on January 31st. Um, the UPR is a unique process which involves periodic review of the human rights records of all 193 UN member states and their fellow member states share their concerns or recommendations for a certain country. And like you said, SJ, UPR for South Korea also took place on the uh, 26th of last month. As mentioned earlier, member states raised various human rights concerns and a contaminated water issue of Japan. First, China started the session by raising the Japanese military sexual slavery issue during World War II, and a representative of China urged Japan to reflect on itself in a responsible manner and compensate the victims. The South Korean government, of course, also raised the issue of both 
the military sex, sexual slavery issue and forced labor issue and called Japan to show responsible manner. In addition, there were voices of concerns over the disposal of contaminated water in Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And indeed, the Japanese government plans to release more than a million tons of contaminated, contaminated water into the sea from this year. And this issue, issue has been particularly strongly addressed by many Pacific Island countries. And in response, Japan refused to change its stance and repeated its previous answers. It argued that the issue of Japanese military sexual slavery was already discussed and resolved at the 2015 Korea-Japan 40 ministers meeting. And regarding the issue of discharging contaminated water from nuclear power plant, Japan said the water contains radioactive materials far below the level allowed by international safety standards, so there should be no problem. I mean, you know, the citizens and residents of Fukushima also are very much against this idea. And mm -hmm. I find it interesting right. that they say that uh, with the Japanese military sexual slavery issue being mm -hmm. already discussed and resolved. And what was it called? The 2015 Korea-Japan Foreign Ministers Meeting, yeah. uh, not a meeting involving the victims uh, for sexual slavery. And this was the big thing, right? And uh, and, and this is the, the most frustrating part is that when you have the member states, it's not just South Korea that's pointing this out, right? Some of the other member states are coming out in Japan. I mean, you guys need to do something about this because it's not right. And usually when you're being kind of grilled in this, you're going, all right, you know, we'll try to make some kind of improvement here. We'll look into this. But they're basically going, no, it's not a problem. We've already resolved it. And so that's kind of been the mentality uh, from the Japanese side for the longest time, which is very frustrating. And that's the reason why, again, no matter how much uh, the current UN administration really wants to improve the ties between uh, Seoul and Tokyo, it's just not happening because of all these uh, historical issues. Right. But let's continue to talk about uh, the discharging of the contaminant water. Uh, we've been talking about this for years now, and uh, this is one of those cases where I, I go, wow, time certainly flies because... Uh, we finally hit that time where uh, Japan is about to really let loose on these uh, contaminant water here. Uh, there's been talks about how it's going to be spring. Mm -hmm. uh, spring is just around the corner right now. And, hey, we've seen the graphs here. We've seen uh, the, the simulation of uh, how the, the water stream and all the, how it, the, the contaminated water, how mm -hmm. it's going to affect the waters off of South Korea and some of the other neighboring countries. It's very concerning. And this is going to happen sooner than expected here. Jill, let's get the latest on this. Uh, sure. Now, Kumin Ilbo reported that from September 2017, from uh, from the end of last year, a total of 5.2 million tons of ballast water was released from Japan's Fukushima prefecture and five neighboring prefectures uh, close to Korean waters. Now, ballast water is fresh water or seawater uh, held in the ballast tanks and cargoes that holds up the, that holds the ships. Uh, so it looks like the water held in the tanks were from the Fukushima uh, was Fukushima water which has not been proven that's not radioactive at this point mm -hmm. uh, so um, the Korean Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries on the same day issued a statement confirming that the ministry is appropriately uh, controlling the situation and according to the ministry there um, have been 519 ships that belong to six Japanese prefectures discharging ballast water into the Korean domestic waters and the amount of ballast water discharged from uh, 2017 until last year has been 3.21 million tons in which there have been 37 ships in the two prefectures of Fukushima and Miyagi and of those ships 37 of them were um, the, the those are the near uh, the locations that were near the Fukushima nuclear power plant okay. at that time and the amount of ballast water discharged by those ships was 120,000 ton but the bigger problem is as you both mentioned is Japan planning to dump millions of tons of contaminated water uh, into uh, the uh, into the, the the sea so um, the Japanese government has said said that they have treated the water and uh, that it meets national standards um, but uh, experts say that uh, it's it's not uh, it's not actually that safe um, according to uh, Robert Richman who is a marine biolog biologist says that traces of some of the um, tritium mm -hmm. that 
is tritium, uh, right? Tritium. Tritium, tritium that yeah. is in the uh, that is in the waters can accumulate into the bodies, and maybe um, it can. Uh, be, uh, up, it can actually mess up our food chain as well. So in the long runs, uh, it's just not tied to ourselves. It's also tied to us in the future as well. Yeah, because again, uh, this is the reason why that the the Fukushima uh, residents are very much against this because mm-hmm. a lot of the people there they work in the the fisheries and agriculture, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was trying to figure out half life of tritium, by the way, is twelve years, mm-hmm. uh, which means that it's going to take twenty four years for it to be basically gone, right. and mm-hmm. the, that's that's a long time. And yes, that, that's the other reason why uh, they say that like if you're pregnant, you're not supposed to eat a whole lot of uh, tuna, Raw fish, tuna, tuna right. right? Because tuna. Tuna yeah. especially has a lot of mercury level. Right. Mm-hmm. And so tritium is another, <laughs> it's cancerous. Uh, and so if it works into the, the food chains and whatever fish, and then eventually we've seen the simulation of how the contaminated water works its way. It, all, mm-hmm. it goes as far as, the, by the way, the western uh, coast of the United States. Mm-hmm. And so, which is another big fishing area, fishery area there. Right. And so eventually it's going to hit the, uh, the South Korean waters and uh, no one is going to feel safe about eating any kind of fish in mm-hmm. South Korean's love their seafood and it's going to be a shame and mm-hmm. the other unfortunate thing is that uh, japan has been uh, hasn't really been so open and clear-cut and transparent right. about their information and all the things that they've done and which is why again it's it's a huge trust issue mm-hmm. that we have with this and uh, for the longest time the south korean government has been trying to fight this but it seems like it's uh, it's it's inevitable right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Seung, you were saying earlier during the UPR that a uh, n- number of uh, Pacific Island countries, in particular, strongly protested against the uh, the release of the contaminated water. But uh, the Chinese government, which again, the contaminated water is o- going to affect the waters off of China as well. They sent a strong warning message to Japan in regards to this. Right. Um, the Chinese government warned on Wednesday that Japan should not release contaminated water into the sea without permission and sufficient consultation with neighboring countries, other stakeholders, and related international organizations. When asked at a regular press conference, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Mao Ning said, China is deeply concerned and it supports the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, and its tactical working group to thoroughly review the issue. It continued its argument saying there is no precedent for discharging nuclear contaminated water into the ocean and called on Japan to provide enough scientific and factual evidence for its decision, resolve international concerns over the safety issue and uncertainty about environmental impact. And South Korea is also taking uh, taking firm stance against Japan's decision. The Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries announced on Thursday that it will strengthen the domestic radiation monitoring system and disclo- disclose the results of the survey transparently by increasing the number of the nation's radiation monitoring facilities by 7 to 52 from this month. Again, I go, I go continue to go back to transparency here. They mm. continue to say that according to the data that they have, that it's uh, safe enough to eat uh, and drink from the, I mean, you can't really drink with seawater, uh, but mm-hmm. eat the, the, you know, fish. The, the fish and all the other seafood that comes out from the coast of uh, Fukushima Prefecture. But I mean, what evidence is, I mean, it's according to the data that they have and they have a, their own sort of standards, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas South Korea, China, by the way, Russia was not very much happy with this uh, idea as well because the water eventually moves its way up to Russia. Mm-hmm. Uh, for our listeners out there, take a look at the simulation of how the, the water stream works and they have uh, how the, uh, the, the contaminated water will affect some of the countries. It literally goes as far as the west coast of the United States. That's it hits right. uh, Alaska as well. And the how fast it moves is also very concerning. So it's not like over a span of 20, 30 years, it eventually uh, reaches uh, like the United States or something like that. I think they mm-hmm. said eventually by like within like three years or something, uh, it reaches the coast of Alaska. But uh, Yang Gurum chiming in our live YouTube saying it's a serious problem. I guess mm-hmm. uh, we cannot eat raw fish in the future. Uh, mm-hmm. So f- I believe for the Korean Peninsula, the area that is affected is like literally the East Sea right. yeah. mm-hmm. or like the Gangneung area, right? Mm-hmm. And also like the Busan area mm-hmm. in Jeju, yes. which is like, what do you do when you go to Jeju and Busan and Gangneung? Eat raw fish. fish. Eat raw fish. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, you have a lot of the people uh, who... That, that's the other thing. Now, it's been for like the longest time. If they look at where the fish comes from in these uh, fishery markets mm-hmm. and they're just basically not 
planning to buy any Japanese fish right. is what they're mm-hmm. doing. But now soon enough, the long-term effect of this is now people are not going to buy Korean fishery goods. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we've seen is a lot of, a great deal of exports of uh, agriculture and fishery goods uh, to a number of different countries out there, despite the fact that it's processed. Uh, but still people are going to say, well, you know, you guys have fish from contaminated sea. We don't want to purchase any of that stuff, and it's going to impact us on the long run. So this is the really unfortunate part with all this. And what's also concerning is even if a person gets sick or gets a disease because of affected by the, the contaminated water or the fish from the contaminated water, it's going to be really hard to prove. Prove it. And yeah. also, uh, is the Japanese government going to pay for the medical bills and right. things like that? No, mm-hmm. that's the unfortunate thing. And, and, and it impacts so many other... And I think this also, uh, because uh, as China said, this is like the first time that it's happening, it could set as precedent. And then there might be other countries out there that go, oh, okay, it's okay mm-hmm. to release contaminated water because Japan's done it before. And... Um, when next thing you know, you just can't eat any more fish in the ocean, right? Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, guys, as always, thank you very much for your report today. Stay safe, and uh, we'll see you guys again. Thank, thank you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.